get started. Welcome to the meeting of the Animal Control Welfare Commission. A discussion of possible action to gather information about the impact on animals, both domestic pets and wildlife, and the California Department of Food and Agriculture's proposed program to eradicate the light brown apple moth, or LBAM, which includes spraying. Discussion will also focus on what pet guardians and others should and should not do to protect animals under their care in the event of spraying or the other components of the eradication program. Speakers will include Dr. Bob Dowell, director of the LBAM program at the California Department of Food and Agriculture and opponents of the spraying. Possible actions include sending a letter to the Board of Supervisors that includes the information gathered during the meeting about the eradication program's impact on both domestic animals and wildlife, and possible support for the supervisor's position opposing spraying. For those of you that are perhaps new to our commission, our commission exists to advise the Board of Supervisors in San Francisco on issues involving animals. Uh, we have several speakers, invited speakers, and we'll start with them. The first speaker is Dr. Bob Dowell uh, from the Department of Food and Agriculture, uh, California, and he's the director of the Light Brown Apple Moth Program. So we know the pheromone can work. We know the pheromone has the ability to knock back the Light Brown Apple Moth population. We're simply going to take one further step and instead of controlling the population, we're going to eradicate it. And again, we have used the same format in terms of the philosophy of how we choose our tools very successfully in the past. They don't claim to be able to tell you why everybody got sick. That's not possible. But they will also note in there that the uh, levels of reports coming out of Santa Cruz and Monterey did not rise up above, up above what's expected on background level for people just generally getting sick every day. Many people get sick. The difference is that people got sick a day or two after we sprayed. And again, it was a temporal sequencing. They, they assumed that because B followed A, A must have caused B. And that's, in fact, oftentimes not the case. It's like having a very windy day and going out and feeling miserable, and you sit back and go, the wind must have blown something in that made me feel bad. Well, lots of reasons for feeling bad, including the bad shellfish you had the night before. Lots of things can happen. What about, there's been a lot of concerns raised about uh, impacts on bees, and, and concerns especially with the smaller microparticles, if you use that format, um, that they're the same size as pollen, and the bees will take them back to the hive, and then you have this continual exposure to um, some chemicals in the inert ingredients that may be toxic to bees. Is, right. What do you have to respond to that? Yeah, when I talk to the beekeepers, I want to talk to uh, people at the extension, the University of California extension on bees. They're delighted we're not spraying them out fine. They're delighted we're going with the pheromone, with the, with the inert ingredients in there. They don't see that as a problem. They don't see these things as being toxic to the bees. The bees are getting killed by lots and lots of things. There's an article, I think, uh, today in the paper, or yesterday, one of the papers I was reading, um, uh, Colony Collapse Disorder. For some reason, colonies are, die are dying off, the bees are packing up and leaving the hive, and the scum going someplace else. Lots and lots of reasons for the bee kills, ranging from varroa mites, a mite that feeds on the blood of the bees. The big mite sticks itself on the bee and sucks the, the fluids out of it, goes in and kills the larvae in the hive. There's pesticide poisoning because people aren't notifying the beekeepers properly. There's environmental conditions, there's all kinds of things. But we have not seen any evidence to indicate that any of these materials that we're using are going to cause bee, bee kills. There's, there's also some concern that they're, because the microparticles were sticky on the outside, they might literally coat bees and they might not be able to fly. Is that a, a concern? No, I, don't, I think, again, the rate we're using, the amount of material we're using per acre. <coughs> um, the material is sticky, but it's not. It's not what you would envision a, a, a sticky ball or a sticky paper. It's designed to stick onto the, onto the surface of the plant material, other uh, surfaces. We don't want it washing off particularly easily. We want it to stick out there and slowly give off the pheromone and do the job we want. Um, so no, we have not seen that as, as, a, as a problem. Again, when I talk with extension bee people, that's not something they raise. I personally, I'm a beekeeper, and I'm quite alarmed at the idea of every single flower that my bees are going to go to, the pollen and nectar is going to have this uh, chemical, these, these microscopic pollen grains on it. And I was wondering, has it been, have actually tried a little 
test or something to see what happens when you, in, you know, a license for a little small plot. I mean, it's all anecdotal. It's just the. You know. well, but, I mean, if, if you take a look, the uh, in order for that to happen, all the flowers have to be open at night when we spray. We have to put out um, fairly huge amounts of material. I mean, we're talking 15 grams of active material, 20 grams. It's not a whole lot of material out there. And again, this is not the same as, as going out with a crop duster or as you would be aware, you know, going out and covering the entire area with the material. Um, we'll continue to look into that. I have no problem doing that. But right at this moment, we look at many flowers not opening up tonight, opening up in the fall, following morning. Uh, the bees are going to be going. As you know, the flowers that have got the best sources, those are going to be the most recent ones that have opened. Mm -hmm. um, if they aren't open at night, they're not going to have anything on the, on the flower. It's going to be opening up. That's going to be a pristine environment. So there's been no studies. Actually, I haven't had Try it. No, we have not tried. That's the thing. It's like if we kill our pollinator, our major pollinator, which is you know has billions of dollars of, of value to our economy, um, especially in the state. Um, you know, it just seems to be wise to do a little testing before you, you apply it over. Again, yeah, um, I mean, it's for a long time. No, 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 I, I agree. But again, like I say, when we, when we sit down and ask the uh, some of the people responsible for this and say, do you project there's going to be a problem? They don't project a problem. Uh, we can look into it some more, but we will. If, if I was talking to people like Eric Lesson of UC Davis and Eric Quinn, God for heaven's sakes, don't do that. Yeah. That's one thing. He goes, oh, you're not, this is great. You're not, you're not spraying a pesticide. You're not saying it's spraying an insecticide. And that's where they're happy. Um, I just met with him last night. He was like, I'm talking about Marin County beekeepers. And he was yeah. quite concerned about it. OK, I'll double check it. Again, when I talk to the people, I'll find out if he's changed his mind.